All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today and bearing with us through a couple microphone issues, but we are ready to roll. Welcome to today's CNCF Live webinar, Windows Came Second. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand it over to Daniel Prisman, Senior Security Researcher at Unit 42 with Palo Alto Networks. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee, but there's a Q&A box that we have been using already at the bottom of your screen, or the right side, rather. Please feel free to drop questions there, and Daniel will get to as many as he can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF, and as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct, and please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today on the CNCF online programs page uh, at community.cncf.io under online, online programs. They're also available via your registration link and the recording will be available on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand it over to Daniel to kick things off. So take it away. Okay, uh, so uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome. Thank you for joining. And you are about to hear a story about how a single missing condition in an if statement enable one of the easiest container escape of uh, recent year. Uh, an escape that affected almost all of the cloud providers in numerous products. Uh, okay, so uh, let's begin. So today I want to talk about the container escape I found over a year ago and how it could affect cloud solution. We will start with motivation, why we should uh, care about it, and then explain some of the fundamentals of containers in general and Windows containers in particular, uh, before moving on to the escape itself. After that, we'll talk a little, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what could we do about it when it wasn't patched, and then about the patch itself and how it fixes this particular problem. Okay, so let's start with an example of why what I'm going to talk about today is important. Uh, Cyberscape was a malware I discovered a few months ago, which specifically targeted Kubernetes to Windows containers. Uh, it abused the issue I'm going to talk about today to break out of the container barrier and escape to the host, which is less protected. Uh, from there, we tried to use the Kubernetes config file, which is only accessible from the host, to spread to the rest of the cluster, escaping the Windows machine uh, itself. It, it spread it to the rest of the cluster. So if the cluster had Linux, uh, Linux containers as well, it could use that too. Uh, as part of my research, I discovered it had active victims, each one being a Kubernetes cluster with the pos possibility of huge amount of processing power. Okay. Uh, okay, now that we have the proper motivation, uh, let's begin. Uh, so what are containers? I know this is a cloud event, so most people here probably know what a container is, but I will go over it quickly just in case. So a container is basically an operating system based virtual machine, meaning it runs inside the operating system with the same kernel as the operating system. It uses operating system features to isolate the virtual machine from the rest of the system, unlike virtual machines, like regular virtual machines, which is, the com is completely separated oper operating systems. Uh, containers can run anything from the desired container must, uh, must match the operating system's version. So for example, you won't be able to run Windows containers on the Linux machine. And one of the most important features of containers is that they pack all the necessary files to run the application. So for instance, if you have a special application with special dependencies, you can pack it all in a lightweight container and send it to the end user. And let's go over what is the difference between the containers and virtual machines. Uh, 
So the main difference is that containers rely on operating systems to make its isolation, while virtual machines rely on the hardware. So virtual machines virtualize everything, including the kernel, while containers run on the same kernel as their host. Because of that, containers are much more portable and efficient. So a container image can be as small as a few kilobytes, while a virtual machine image will usually be at least few gigabytes in size. Uh, all of that comes with a price, of course. Uh, containers are much less secure than virtual machines. So on the left side, you can see a virtual machine infrastructure with a hypervisor managing all the machines. Each machine has a separate operating system. And on the right, there is an infrastructure of a Docker machine hosting a few different applications. Each application is inside a separate container, but they are all running on the same host operating system with the same kernel. Uh, OK, diving deeper into the internal of containers here. Uh, we are only talking about Linux containers for now. Uh, what needs to be contained? Well, obviously, you would want to limit the container's access to resources such as CPU, RAM, network bandwidth, disk bandwidth, and such. This is done using a feature called cgroups. Uh, these features allow us to limit resource usage for a group of processes. Uh, you would want to limit the visibility the containers have too. So if we would only limit resources, nothing would stop a malicious container from just changing its own resource limitations. Uh, and for that, we would also want to uh, we would also want to, to limit the container's visibility to some of the host objects, such as processors, network interfaces, users, mounts, and such. And this is done using a feature called namespaces. OK, but uh, this talk is about Windows containers, so let's move forward to Windows. Uh, in order to create a good solution for containers in Windows, the same requirements I, talk about, I talked about in the last slide need to be implemented here. Uh, luckily, Windows had a solution for the resource limitation for years. It's called job objects, and they do pretty much the same thing as cgroups in Linux. Uh, there is nothing too interesting about them, just as I said in the last slide. But it's important to know that the feature existed in, in, in Windows for years. It's not, it's not new. Um, Windows version of cgroups. Uh, OK, that was. Job object was the Windows version of Sigmus, but what about the visibility isolation? So until recently, Windows didn't actually have a solution for this. Uh, and that's why Windows containers didn't exist until only a few years ago. Uh, OK, but uh, luckily, a few years ago, Microsoft came up with a feature called Server Silo which directly provides the missing feature that were necessary in order to create a container solution. Uh, so server silos provide everything that namespaces provide in Linux. They isolate the object manager, the registry, networking, devices, and basically any named object that a process can access. Uh, there are two types of Windows containers. There are Hyper-V containers and server silo containers. Um, they're not officially called server silo containers, but they are using the server silo feature as their isolation uh, mechanism. So they are referred to as server silo containers. And on the right, you can see how, how a Hyper-V container architecture looks. Not, not much different than a regular virtual machine. And Microsoft indeed calls this, uh, call this uh, containers uh, lightweight virtual machines. So they are not actually a container. Each container has its own lightweight kernel. Basically, it is the Microsoft version of a VM and is not what we are here to talk about today. Uh, we are here to talk about the left side. As you can see, more traditional meaning of the containers. One kernel with few containers for different applications. And this is done using server silos. And as you can see, all the containers are using the same system processes and same kernel. Um, OK. Uh, in order to fully understand how server silos isolates containers, 
one must understand the basics of the root directory object, which is a key feature in the Windows operating systems. Without getting into too deep in, uh, about this mechanism, it suffice to say that all applications visible named objects, such as file, registry keys, events, mutex, RPC ports, stuff like that, are hosted in a root namespace, which allows applications to create, locate, and share these objects among themselves. And the key here is named objects. So any object that you can access from your code using a name is a named object. Usually it's files and stuff like that, but there are other things. Uh, okay, so take a look at this screenshot from the WinObj application. Uh, there is an application called WinObject. It shows you the root directory object. It's by sysinternals. And it shows the root directory object perfectly. As you can see on the left, there are many directories under the root directory object. And under global, question mark, question mark, there are tons of symbolic links, including the C letter symbolic links. So when you're accessing your C drive in your Windows machine, it is in fact a symbolic link to the actual device. And as you can see, there are many more symbolic links over there, but the most relevant to us is indeed the C link, which points to the actual file system device, uh, which in this case is a hardest volume tree. Uh, in this screenshot, you can see a root directory object of the host and not a container. Uh, it can be a virtual machine, but it is it has its own kernel. Uh, we'll soon see how a root directory object of a, con of a container looks like. Okay, so in this screenshot, however, you can see what the container looks like in the root directory object. So notice on the left, there is a silos directory. Every server silo container will have its own subdirectory under this directory, with the name being the server silo ID. So in this particular case, I had a single container with a server silo ID of uh, 804. And as you can see, the silo directory is almost identical to the host directory. This is because uh, Windows tried to virtualize a mini operating system as accurately as possible. So most of the symbolic links that the host have, the container have too, so with different destinations, of course. Uh, so we'll discuss the server silo root directory object further later in the talk. Okay, let's move to let's move over to an actual example of how the root directory object is used in a simple create file call. So the create file API receives a file path and returns a handle to that file. The process can read, write, or do other actions with that handle depending on the permissions of the process asked when, the, when calling the create file. And in this example, we are calling create file on, on, uh, on the C drive named secret.txt. Note that the C part is just a symbolic link, as you can see in the screenshot below. So C is first converted to something the kernel can actually query. It is converted to the root directory object form of this path. This is done in user mode before the call arrives to the kernel. And after that, in the kernel, the kernel query that global C path in the root directory object that I show earlier and receive the destination of that symbolic link. It then queried that destination it received from the symbolic link still under the root directory object, but this time the parsing end with an actual device and not a symbolic link. So the parsing is over. Uh, at this point, having at this point having an actual device, the kernel forwards the request to the device driver. In this case, it's the file system driver, and from from here, the file system driver takes the execution. And uh, that part is less important for us. But remember that the part where the kernel received the symbolic link target and queried that under the root directory object. Uh, until it found the actual device. It will be important for us later. Uh, also remember that this query was an example of a query from the host and not from inside a container. It is slightly different from calls that come from inside a container and we will talk about it, so about that scenario in a minute. Okay, so uh, before giving an example of a file access from inside a container, let's discuss 
how the system decides that a call comes from a container. As you can see on the left, there are plenty of functions that can decide if a call comes from a server silo or not. And the kernel, the kernel uses different functions in different scenarios, but in our specific case, if the kernel decides a call comes from a container, it queries the path we saw before the global C path relative to the server silo subdirectory inside the root directory object. Uh, and this will happen every, ac uh, every access of a named object such as file. So as you can see on the right, it will try to uh, query and parse the symbolic link relative to the silos 804 subdirectory instead from the root directory object. Okay, so in this screenshot uh, from IDA, you can see the branch in the kernel where it decides if path will be queried to the actual root directory object or to the server silo subdirectory in the root directory object. And uh, this is done using the PS get permanent silo context kernel function, which is one of the many functions that I showed earlier that the kernel decides if a call comes from server silo or not. Okay, so let's go over an example of accessing a file from a container. Uh, as before, we are accessing uh, a file named secret.txt uh, under the C drive, but this time from inside a container. I'm scoping the user mode part where the API adds the global part before the C letter uh, because we covered it already, and jumping straight to the kernel part. Uh, the kernel calls PS get parent and silo context and retrieves a silo context and not null. So it takes the branch of, uh, of a server silo in the kernel code, uh, 804 uh, in our case, and it queries the relevant directory under the subdirectory of the silo in the root directory object. And it does that until it finds the C symbol in clean, exactly as it did from the host, but this time relative to the 804 subdirectory in the root directory object. Um, this time, the C symbolic link points to a virtual hard disk device under the silo subdirectory in the root directory object. So before that, it was hard disk device volume three, to those who, who remember, and this time it's virtual hard disk uh, and some more numbers after it. This virtual hard disk eventually points to a path in the host file system. But it has its own device to do it in the uh, file system driver. OK, but uh, take a look at the, at the screenshot. And this is the interesting part. That virtual hard disk device isn't a device at all. It's a symbolic link too, which points to itself a symbolic link. So we end up in an infinite loop because we query a symbolic link that its target is the same symbolic link. So we will query it again and symbolic link again. And this was the point of my research when I realized there is something I'm missing here because the request to the file was successful and I was able to read and write to, to the file in, in my container. So it was obviously working, but on the other hand, it looked like we should have been stuck in an infinite loop. So what's going on here? Okay, let's, it's, it's relevant. Let's go over uh, what the requirements are. Every container, either in Linux or in Windows, needs to be able to communicate with some of the host devices. It can be a screen to show output or a network device or the file system. Uh, so in the way Windows works, some of the symbolic links must point to the device in the host root directory object for the container to work. Otherwise, the container, the container won't have any access to anything. So for example, the virtual file system is eventually just a path in the host file system, and the container must have access to that path. So it must have some access to the host file system device. Uh, and we are getting closer to the actual escape, I promise. Uh, the way it is done in Windows is that the process with the right permission, permissions can set a symbolic link as global. A global symbolic link will always be looked at relative to the host root directory object, regardless if the process that is trying to parse it is inside a container. So and when a container is created, Docker sets some of the container's symbolic link as global, 
And that's why the container can maintain some sort of communication with the host. Non-global symbolic links are, pass, are passed relative to the silos root directory object, as we discussed earlier. OK. Um, so in this screenshot, you can clearly see the condition in IDA. EAX holds one of the symbolic links parameter, the one that holds if a symbolic link is global or not. And if it is, the execution will take the right branch will, and will re retrieve the root directory object from a global variable uh, in the kernel. And if not, it will take the left branch and then we'll have to get uh, the silo context first. As you can see, the left branch called PS get, get parent silo context. So when we are trying to parse a symbolic link, eventually there is a condition. And if the symbolic link is global, the, the link will be parsed uh, relative to the root directory object. And if, and if it's not global, it will be parsed relative to the uh, server silo subdirectory object, in our case, the 804 subdirectory. Uh, so if the symbolic link is global, the link will be uh, passed from here instead of from here. It will be passed from the uh, 944 in this case and not from the root. Uh, just a clarification, it's not 804 anymore because it took me some time to create this presentation and I wasn't able to get the exact container ID again for, for taking this screenshot. Uh, so, okay, let's move to the hows. Uh, how can we exploit that global symbolic link feature to break out of a container? Uh, so the function that is in charge of making symbolic links global is the undocumented empty set information symbolic link function. And after reversing it, uh, reverse engineering it in order to understand what parameters the function expects, I discovered that it requires SE uh, TCB privilege permissions in order to make links global. And sadly, the regular container user uh, doesn't have those permissions. Uh, but lucky for us, there is another process in the container scope, meaning it is visible to the container's user, called CXL service uh, .exe. Uh, This process has, in fact, SCTCB privilege, among other privileges. And lucky for us, again, by default, the normal container user is administrator. OK, so take a look at this screenshot from IDA. Uh, as you can see, there is a check for SE uh, TCB privilege before moving forward with the execution in making a symbolic link global. Uh, OK, so let's go over uh, the escape plan. First, we impersonate CXX service to gain its TCB privileges. There are numerous ways to do that, such as thread impersonation or DLL injection. And after that, we create a regular symbolic link, which at this point is not global. It's not global yet. And it points to our local containerized C drive. It doesn't help us. And then we call anti-set information symbolic link with our newly created symbolic link to make this symbolic link global. And at this point, we have full access to the host C drive by using our local X drive. And from there, the possibilities are endless. OK, so I'll explain it again a bit slower. We create a, we create a symbolic link. It's not global yet. We then we, we named it X, and we make it points to C. Uh, so we basically have a redundant symbolic link X that points to a symbolic link C inside a container. After that, we call the anti set information symbolic link because we impersonated a process that has that permissions. And we give it the parameter, we give the anti set information symbolic link function, we give it X. And it makes it global. So now we have an X symbolic link inside the container that points to a C drive outside the container. So we broke the container's barrier. Uh, in this graph, you can see how Siloscape operated. Siloscape, the model from the beginning. After finding a, vulner a vulnerable cluster using uh, services like Shodan, it used known one days to get uh, its payload in the Windows container. It then used the container escape I described to get access to the host. 
And after that, it used the Kubernetes config file to get control of the rest of the cluster. It specifically targeted Kubernetes using, uh, using Windows containers. After, uh, after breaking out of the container and gaining access to the, to the host, it issued a, a Kubernetes command to see its uh, permissions in the cluster. And if, uh, if it didn't have enough permissions to create other deployments, it just quitted and didn't even, want, didn't even use that cluster. So what I was thinking, it, it, it tried to just gain free processing power. And if it can't deploy uh, new, new, new containers, it doesn't help it very much. So uh, how are cloud providers affected? Well, the trivial thing is any Kubernetes cluster with a Windows node, an attacker that gain access to that container can just break out of the host and possibly spread from there, like Siloscape did. And depending on how the cluster is configured, said attacker will at least be able to control every, every container that uh, the specific node uh, he compromises hosting. So even, even if uh, the cluster is configured properly, uh, someone that broke out of the container to the host will be able to, con to control the containers that this particular host is hosting. Um, as Siloscape did, an attacker could possibly spread in the rest of the cluster as well if the, cast if the cluster is, is not uh, well configured. And another possibility is the whole container as a service service. Imagine a cloud provider offering Windows containers as a service and not part of an entire cluster. An attacker can host a malicious container uh, and break out of his own container and gain access to other customers' private containers. And I'm not saying I found out something like that uh, happened or happening. I just think it, it, it can be done. OK, uh, let's go over the timeline. Uh, as you can see in the timeline, the Windows containers were vulnerable to this issue for quite some time, almost five years since release. But the more important issue here is that Windows containers were vulnerable to this escape over a year and a half after it was made public. And during, the, during this time, anything that uses Windows container was vulnerable too as a byproduct. Uh, as as we can as we as we saw there are, there were uh, players in the in the community there were like, like for example Siloscape that used uh, this vulnerable thing that made public to gain free processing power. Okay, so let's talk about what we uh, as either cloud providers or users could do about it while it was uh, while it was while it was vulnerable. Um, so we have a vendor, in this case, Microsoft, which takes some time to fix the container escape. What could it do about it? Well, there are a few things. First of all, in order for an attacker to even be in a position to use this issue, he must, need, he must first gain access to your container. So most of the time, this happens through uh, an outdated uh, application in your uh, container or a misconfigured container manager. So keep your applications up to date, even if they are inside a container. Uh, this is relevant to both uh, Linux and Windows, and this one isn't relevant for cloud providers because uh, this this one isn't relevant for cloud provider because it uses user control. I mean, the cloud providers let the user control the cluster, so the user is uh, is uh, accountable for uh, updating its own application. And next, and this is only relevant to users and cloud providers, I advise you to run your containers as container user instead of administrator. It would be, uh, and this one only, only for Windows, it would be much harder to pull off something like that without administrator permissions. Uh, Kubernetes supports that as well. Uh, so there is a special variable you can set in your YAML to run your applications as container user instead of administrator. Um, this was a possible solution for cloud providers while, while waiting for a fix for Microsoft, simply changing the default user inside a container. So if I'm a cloud provider right now and I'm letting my user uh, create Windows containers inside their cluster, but I don't want them to be vulnerable, I could change the default user uh, of the Windows container to container user until 
Microsoft fixes this issue. And third, update, update your Windows host. This is mostly relevant uh, for cloud providers and not the user, um, or for users who are running their own cloud environment on their own machine. Um, so keep your Windows host updated. And last but not least, and again, this is relevant for both users and cloud providers, configure your Kubernetes properly. So for example, uh, in the case of Siloscape, uh, it was it managed to break out of uh, out of the container to the host and spread in the in the entire cluster. And as I see it, there is no reason for a cluster for a for a host for a specific host to be able to create deployments on other hosts. And that's what happened with Sales. Uh, Let's go over uh, about on the Microsoft patch. So a few weeks ago, Microsoft actually patched the anti-set information symbolic link function. And the patch is easy to understand and straightforward. Any call to anti-set information symbolic link from a thread inside a container will be blocked with the status privilege not held error code. And this is done using the PS is current thread in server silo function, which is one of the many functions that let the kernel decide if a process or a thread comes from a server silo or not. Um, which, as its name suggests, checks whether the current thread is associated with a process inside the server silo. Uh, on the right, you can see how the function uh, looks after the patch. And on the left, it, how it looked before the patch. So they simply added the condition to check, uh, it makes sense to check if uh, if uh, if calling if the process that calling the anti set information symbolic link comes from a container or not, and if it is, it won't uh, it won't let it. Uh, okay, so here are some uh, some of my articles about uh, about this subject. I covered everything. I talked about it here in details. Uh, if anyone is interested, and that's it. Any questions? Nice job. Are there any questions for Daniel before we wrap up? <laughs> it was very thorough then. Okay. All right. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for a thank wonderful you. presentation. Um, if that's it, then thank you everyone for joining us and the webinar recording and slides will be online later today. We'll see you at another webinar soon.